uh, with the Working Families Party and with a group called the Grassroots Policy Project. Uh, was extremely uh, gratified to see everyone here. I thought we had a fantastic uh, opening from Mo and, uh, and first panel. Um, we're gonna really, uh, I think, change registers now in terms of the discussion uh, to get into um, some uh, hopefully hard-headed discussions about the state of the American electorate um, and the opportunities for radical politics uh, at this moment, um, and also uh, some of uh, maybe the constraints that we're, that we're up against. Um, I do just want to say, I think uh, maybe helping us sort of make that transition from the last discussion to the, to, to the one that we're having now, part of why it seems to me at least that the populism question doesn't want to go away um, is that uh, this sort of populist moment that we're in, uh, we've seen the reintroduction of a language of class and a language of class that is radically popular and potentially very inclusive that had largely disappeared from American politics for, for an entire generation. And I think those of us who have lived through this and been politically active in this moment have felt the possibility of that antagonistic language of class articulated in an inclusive way um, opening up entire new frontiers for organizing, for um, changing people's consciousness, for uh, finding new coalitions, new demands, all of that. And so I think part of what we're just grappling with is what is the nature of that opening? What is the nature of, uh, and what is the extent of the class language and the class thinking that we can inject into politics at this moment? Um, and also what are some of the contradictions given um, the deep foundations uh, of white supremacy in this country and around the world. Um, so uh, to, to dig, or, dig deeper on uh, some aspects of this question, uh, as it is facing, uh, as we face it in our political moment, uh, we have three uh, very distinguished speakers. Um, so uh, uh, Kathy Cohen, Amna Akbar, and uh, Daniel Schlotzman. Um, I am gonna, I think we're gonna go Daniel, Amna, Kathy. So, uh, and so I'll just, I'll introduce them in that, in that order. Um, we were running a little behind, but since lunch is short and we're, we're, um, uh, we're three instead of four on this panel, uh, I think I'm gonna try to get us close to finishing uh, at the 1245 time that's at the, uh, that's on the schedule or, you know, at, at most five minutes uh, past that. So everybody gets to enjoy their lunch. Um, so, uh, Daniel Schlotzman is Joseph and Bertha Bernstein Associate Professor of Political Science at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he's the author of When Movements Anchor Parties, Electoral Alignments in American History, uh, which came out from Princeton in 2015. And he's now writing with Sam Rosenfeld at Colgate University, a book on visions of party from Martin Van Buren to Donald Trump, and a book on financialization and center-left parties um, in the US and the UK. And he didn't say it in his bio, but you can read uh, Danny's work in N plus one and a whole a bunch of other popular publications and I, I recommend those writings to you. Um, Amna Akbar is Associate Professor of Law at Ohio State University. Uh, her research and teaching focus on social movements, law reform, policing, race, and inequality. Her scholarship explores the intersections of national security and criminal law and the potential of social movements to transform our thinking about law, law, en law enforcement, and law reform. She writes broadly for academic and popular audiences in outlets like NYU Law Review, UCLA Law Review, NOMOS, Citizen Studies, the Journal of Legal Education, Law and Political Economy, The Nation, Boston Review, and more. In her teaching and lawyering work, she is deeply engaged with law and organizing in Ohio and around the country. For the 2018-2019 academic year, Amna, uh, Professor Akbar was, Princeton, was at Princeton University as a law and public affairs fellow and visiting scholar. Um, and last but not least, Kathy Cohen, is a professor at the University of Chicago, an author of The Boundaries of Blackness, AIDS, and the Breakdown of Black Politics, and Democracy Remix, Black Youth, and the Future of American Politics. She's also co-editor of Women Transforming Politics, an alternative reader, and founded and directs the Gen Forward Survey, which I know she's gonna be um, talking with us about today. Her articles have been published in numerous journals and edited volumes. In addition to her academic work, Cohen was a founding board member and co-chair of the board of the Audre Lorde Project in New York. She also served on the boards of Kitchen Table, Women of Color Press, the, C the Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies, and the Arcus Foundation. Cohen was a founding member of Black AIDS Mobilization, BAM, and a core organizer for two international conferences, Black Nations, Queer Nations, and Race, Sex, Power. Cohen has served as an active member in numerous organizations such as the Black Radical Congress, ACT UP New York, and African American Women in Defense of Ourselves. She is also the founder and director of the Black Youth Project. Currently, she is helping to direct 
the new organization Scholars for Social Justice, and serves on the Field Foundation Board. So that, Daniel, the floor is yours. It, it's a pleasure to be here, and it is a special pleasure to be in a rare role as the moderate in the room. And so I'm going to embrace <laughs> this uh, special role for me, and I want to talk through the dilemmas of majoritarian electoral politics. Uh, I think that other people are talking through the terrain of social struggle, the political imaginary, but the rules of American politics, high politics, are constraints. They are constraints that should be considered from the very first. And it is the goal that it's a strategic breakthroughs, not founder on tactical shoals. If we want that, then we have to take institutions seriously. And we also have to start with where we are. The old joke from Maine, and I'm sure it came from other places. Someone asks, how do you get to Booth Bay Harbor? The answer comes back, well, I wouldn't start from here. Um, you know, not a great joke, but <laughs> a useful one. Uh, uh, and and uh, anyway, in three ways, I want to start from where we are, precisely because if we don't think through uh, how we start from here, then they will. Um, yeah. Talk a little bit about the sort of post New Deal Democratic Party and then some strategic dilemmas that we face from here. The past, let's say, 40, but it doesn't really matter if it's 40 or 50 or something like that, years have seen a Democratic Party without a real coherent party project, without a sense of how it is going to wield state power and on whose behalf, a kind of politics of listlessness. But at the same time, there are two themes we have to keep in mind to make sense of, of where the Democrats and have gotten. And they are polarization and neoliberalism. You can't really understand present politics without thinking of how they have interacted, that the old moderates and the old conservative Democrats, bull weevils, the folks with whom the freedom Democrats were fighting in 64 and their descendants are gone. Uh, the Democratic Leadership Council was formed in 1985 as the voice of new Democrats, basically by a bunch of Southern politicians who were sort of acting out quite directly the conservative claim from the leopard that if we want things to stay as they are, things will have to change. And it turns out that the world they wanted in which um, white, moderate, conservative Democrats could win statewide elections in the southern states in which they'd won elections for a long time went away. But at this, and, and so there is a much more coherently, although by no means uniformly and or willing to do very much that's active liberal democratic party, but at the same time, the forces of neoliberalism are real, have, were in the ascendance, and retreat is very, very slow. Uh, in 1997, the infamous pollster Mark Penn decided that he wanted to uh, break up the electorate he was appealing to between, quote, downscale suburban values voters who are interested in welfare and crime and upscale new economy Dems. The former ha exist as an important presence inside the polity. There are ways in which there are folks who want to recapture but are moved away from voting for Democrats. The upscale new economy Dems are very, very much present. Um, after 2000, New Democrats recede, and as Democrats decide that they want to counter the right, make, in a lot of ways, an essential mistake, um, and that is to find the story of the rise of the right not in mobilizing resentment, uh, but in pure institution building, this PowerPoint that Rob Stein goes circulating around in 2004 that leads to, for example, the founding of um, the Center for American Progress was basically a case of survivor bias. They noticed that there were a bunch of conservative institutions that had been around for a while, and they failed to notice all the important pieces of mobilizing resentment that had come and gone. Uh, and since then, of course, a lot more uh, movement building that leads us to where we are. But that it is the combination of polarization and neoliberalism that 
I think, frames the uh, politics we now face. So there are three strategic dilemmas I want to talk about. I will frame these more in terms of national politics, but there are close cousins of them in uh, what happens inside blue states, how do we become uh, good critical friends to folks who are not always where we want them, the sort of questions that working families have been dealing with for a long, long time. Uh, and I will call them the problem of geography, the problem of coalitions, and the problem of organization. Um, the problem of geography, one which I'll start to talk about, single member electoral systems hurt parties of the left. Parties of the left tend to waste their votes in cities. Uh, in the US now, this problem is particularly acute. Uh, the median Senate seat is, and obviously, how do we have the American electoral system? It didn't just come up from bad luck. This is a series of <laughs> historical evolutions in from 1787 on through the Republican Party, pushing a lot of uh, empty, uh, fighting the Indian Wars and pushing through empty states that they thought would elect Republican senators at the end of the 19th century and on and on. So uh, this is how we got where we are. Uh, the median Senate seat is to the right of the median House seat, is to the right of the median electoral vote for the presidency, is to the right of the median voter in the popular vote for the presidency. And in a roughly 50-50 country, that hurts badly. What it means, of course, is the need to win. And I underline win, not just create buzz, not just do better than the hapless person going through the motions the last cycle, but win in places we have not. And a few new Senate seats ameliorates this problem, but it does not solve it. And it suggests that a coalition that we want to build is a geographically robust coalition and a coalition that embraces states that are substantially whiter and more rural than the country as a whole, precisely because that is what takes a majority in the Senate, and a majority in the Senate uh, is the key to the courts, which I think we'll hear more. The problem of coalitions, and again, starting where we are, the, we have a real disjunction at the moment between the coalition that we uh, see on the Democratic side and the alignment we want that would build something like multiracial populism, what's it? Radical democracy from the anti-racist left, did I get that right? Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> while avoiding the bad, bad, bad hazy nostalgia for the very, very imperfect New Deal order, Democrats in the United States, in common with center-left parties elsewhere in peer countries, are drawing very heavily from the well-educated, from uh, the upper middle class, Piketty has called this the Brahmin left. And this is not just a story about reaction to Donald Trump or anything. I mean, that, that you go back to 1974 and you see all these so-called Watergate babies that are elected in the wake of the last impeachment. And they are very not class oriented, very not lo locally rooted uh, folks. Christopher Matthews, as he then styled himself when he was Tip O'Neill's young uh, communications director, said, in 100 districts, they all look the same. Uh, and this has been going on and on. And so the question is, given the coalition we have, given many, many, many folks who, if you ask them standard issue ideology questions, do you consider yourself a strong liberal? Yes, I do. One to seven. How do, do you think that? Uh, do you think that we sh you would accept more taxes in exchange for more government services? They say yes, and yet we have the sense that um, a multiracial populism might not have them as the folks we'd start off with. What do we do with this coalition? In what ways are there opportunities to work with the coalition we have? Are there more opportunities in national politics than in, for example? core local issues like education and housing where these folks will not surrender their gains. Um, are the battle lines, and the very broad support for something like a wealth tax might suggest this, are the battle lines in class politics drawn in different places than we might have thought or than experience from before the new Gilded Age might have led us to believe? But what does a majority coalition 
working outwards from existing support look like? Um, third, the problem of organization. And that, it, it, and this is a problem in radical politics always, and I think it's especially, but whether or not it's especially, it's still a problem, uh, a problem now, that we know, we have seen how activism gets built. We have seen how activism is sparked. Sustaining that activism is a real challenge, and sustaining that activism not just among either a core cadre of organizers or among exactly the folks in what some call the professional managerial class I was just talking about is really hard. We are in a period of ongoing civic associational decline that has not been reversed. Formal parties are hollowed out. Um, the other side has got in white evangelical churches, in gun clubs, the space for organizing that we don't have. There is a kind of catch-22 between revival of the labor movement and political revival. We can't really, really, really revive labor until we change our politics. We can't really change our politics until we revive labor. Um, and this is, as I say, always, and we were beginning to poke at some of this in the last panel, been a problem for radical politics. You look at the stories of radical reconstruction of the Farmers Alliance of Jesse Jackson's campaigns, and you see various versions of there are moments of democratic promise, to take the Goodwin title, um, what happens to them, how are they sustained, but that I think that these are really urgent now, and um, to various people in this room who are to talk, talk as the, uh, as I say, the relative moderate to the, to the radicals here, who are captivated by the Michelle's critique, the other side of that coin is very important. How is it that ongoing organization can sustain us through what are inevitable hard times? Um, I think these are three linked problems, and they're not only often wished away, but if they are treated discreetly as separable problems, then they lend themselves to the kind of, quote, targeted solutions that pander to the worst in the white rural uh, pandering. Claire McCaskill loses her Senate race and is now on MSNBC all the time saying, listen to me, and you can, you can win races like the one I didn't win in um, <laughs> uh, you know, white haute bourgeois, oh, if we don't. We don't restore the salt deduction. It's all over uh, politics and in various kinds of elite-led clicktivism that are ways to solve organizational problems. Uh, and that it's worth thinking through what are our task here, the, the ways to build from strength in each of these areas, which means asking some questions that are complicated questions. What kinds of compromises are OK? What kind of compromises will seed rather than foreclose future opportunities? How do we design policies in ways that make them attractive to key voter blocks, that avoid directly alienating folks we want on our side, that make elected officials who are making the sort of transactional um, calculations that elected officials make more likely to end up where we want them to feel that they are beholden, I've written about this in various ways, to the kinds of electoral blocks that uh, a multiracial populism would represent rather than the alternative. How can moderates be helpful in ways that don't destroy a core project we're working toward? There are pieces of anti-monopolism. There are pieces of disquiet in American empire that resonate in various other parts of the American political system from what's represented in this room. But there are clearly points where we're not going. I don't think that anybody here has the slightest illusion that when Josh Hawley is talking about Facebook that this is anything but bad, bad, bad. Um, but there are points where I think that there are compromises to be made. How? Which, which is to, uh, one, one more thing, and, and this is a late breaking one, uh, how to work with allies in ways that do not co-opt some of the language of movements that are is now in a left moment becoming quite fashionable 
among people who have much, much less radical critiques. I will, our late breaking moment, um, a friend of mine is on the Boston City Council. I got a text at the break from her husband who keeps me apprised of events in Boston that uh, a member of the Boston City Council who last week uh, talked to 160 charter school donors in the suburbs uh, has an event scheduled for late November on um, change making from the ground up for which she has recruited a bunch of the sort of people who'd be gullible enough to go to such things. But uh, <laughs> this is a very clear, this city councilor who I will uh, <laughs> not name, but if you ask me, I will tell you, uh, has read the tea leaves of what movement politics sounds like. This is not someone who is completely on the other side, but this is not where we are. Right? This is you know, how to bring in, how to, you know, if any of you want to show up at this event on uh, movement building and, and suggest some things, it might be fun, uh, how to make that work. Uh, so it, it, all of which to bring these questions together, how to organize in ways that build durable bridges across geographies and coalitions, because given where we are, that's how we get where we need to go. Let's start briefly on a biographical note. Um, I graduated from law school about 15 years ago, and so started my career as a poverty lawyer and a civil rights and human rights lawyer, um, and very quickly started to feel like I was doing um, the least worst thing I could do with my law degree, but was not very excited by what I was doing. And so one of the things that has happened for me in the last uh, five years since the Ferguson Rebellion in 2014, um, and you know, becoming involved in different ways in both local organizing and to some extent uh, national movement building um, is in watching young organizers and movements uh, organize and then uh, not immediately, but you know, within a few years turning to, well at first the kind of center of contestation being a lot of legal institutions um, and in those contestations telling stories very different than the ones that law uh, tells about itself and that lawyers tell about how the law functions. And then secondly, a few years after that, with the vision for black lives um, and a number of other developments since then that I'll talk about, um, movements turning to uh, policy platforms and law reform as a tool and a platform for reimagining the terrain of political struggle and its possibilities um, has really kind of given me a life uh, again in terms of thinking and feeling excited about being a lawyer um, and um, working with law. And so what I want to talk about today is a little bit, is thinking about the potential and the possibilities of law reform and what we can kind of see and learn from what has happened in the last um, five years, uh, as well as uh, it's, uh, the limits of law reform and the way that we should kind of proceed with caution uh, because of course it is not um, the end. So we're living, as we all know, in an age of protest, organizing, and striking. Black Lives Matter and the Red Nation, Mejente, and critical resistance. The nurses and the teachers, the tenants and the Amazon warehouse staff, the drivers at Uber and Lyft. Like the rebellions in Ferguson and Baltimore or the Standing Rock encampment, all of this social movement activity should be understood, as we all know in this room, as democratic insurgencies that speak to the shrunken domain of formal politics under capitalism and colonialism. We are also living in the time of the Squad, Bernie and Warren, the Democratic Socialists of America, the Working Families Party and the Sunrise Movement the era of Jacobin and, commu and uh, Commune, Catalyst, Lux, and The Dig. Slogans born of protest in the last several years like the 99th percent, Black Lives Matter, Abolish ICE, and Me Too are remaking our political vocabulary and its grammar. We are debating the relationship between open borders and abolition and socialism, between capitalism, colonialism, and enslavement, race, gender, and class. Not whether, but how to close Rikers in New York City, whether a progressive prosecutor is a contradiction in terms, whether capitalism's crises can be regulated away, or whether we need a new political, economic, social system altogether. We are studying and learning from each other, histories of resistance, and what it can teach us for today. 
so I want to talk uh, about the exciting potential of possibilities and pitfalls of law reform today. As I said, the left is growing in terms of its ideological purchase and its ability to mobilize people with its message. Law reform proposals and campaigns have become a central part of our toolkit. The Vision for Black Lives, the Green New Deal, the Red Deal, Chicago's Reparations Ordinance, Florida's Amendment 4, Ohio's Issue 1. Law reform is an important tool, one we should approach strategically and with care. Contestation of legal institutions and obligations through bailouts, rent strikes, and organizing to close jails have also become an important part of the picture, which I'll focus on less during my formal remarks, but I'm interested in the connections between those things. And of course, as we approach these law reform, uh, kind of these law-related strategies, we can never forget that our underlying goal is to build an ever-growing mass movement of ordinary people, and that we are nowhere near that. And for that mass movement to transform the society altogether, beyond capitalism and colonialism, toward a different relationship between the state, the land, and our labor, and other each other and other living beings. So I think the centrality of law reform projects today reflects the failures of 20th century left revolutionary politics and a recognition of the immensity of US military and police power that rose up to crush movements here and around the world. Um, and I'm happy to be challenged and corrected on this later. But we are not mired in debates over reform versus revolution. We are focused on reforms and experiments that could transform our politics, our relationships to each other, and the land around us. These law reform proposals are significant for a number of reasons, but they also have limitations, so we should be careful to use them as a way to build power and expand the size of our multiracial movements, never confuse the reforms we are pushing for today uh, as the end goal. So one of law's central mythologies is that law comes before politics, that law in itself is a way to neutralize, or law is in itself a way to neutralize distributional conflict and struggle. This is part of what insulates, insulates law and the state from challenge. Law becomes status quo with a horizon beyond sight. Sure, there may be some problems, but law bends towards justice, we are told, apparently of its own benevolent volition. But the less law reform proposals today denaturalize law as before politics, and they show law to be a terrain and tool for political struggle. They point to law as a central site for contesting, polarizing, and reimagining our democratic order. They um, in ways that stand in stark contrast to the prevailing liberal legal approach to social change focused on courts, test cases, and individual plaintiffs. I'm not talking about courts. Um, <laughs> okay. Movements today are using law as a tool for organizing. So recall the Sunrise Movement's occupation of Pelosi's office or the videotaped encounter with Dianne Feinstein. So they turn to law in creative ways as a power flex of sorts. And in this way, radical law reform proposals make clear that law is a realm of politics. It's not fixed, neutral, naturally good, or beyond contestation. It is a terrain of struggle. Today's left law reform proposals, and the policy platforms in particular, also re-narrate the crisis as fundamental, historical, structural, and contingent. The Movement for Black Lives, for example, took the question of police violence the presumed focus publicly of Black Lives Matter, Ferguson, and Baltimore, and instead wrote of an expansive, wrote an expansive visioning document in the Vision for Black Lives, situating a critique in black history and intellectual traditions and an imagination of alternative futures in black freedom movements. The vision didn't call for indictments uh, for police killing or better training or supervision on diverse police forces. It calls for an end to the war on black people, pointing the finger at a range broad range of institutions, typically narrated in popular and academic discourse as distinct, the state and the market together, for example, and with a long history and the responsibility for which rests with many institutions. Or the Green New Deal, which takes the question of looming environmental disaster and connects it to labor and infrastructure. The Red Deal, in turn, reminds us that the struggle for envir the environment and the land must be won more broadly and more deeply against capitalism and colonialism explicitly uses the framework of non-reformist reforms, reforms that don't tweak or ameliorate the current order, those that aim to make it harder for the current political, economic, and social structure to reproduce itself and gesture towards new possibilities. Non-reformist reforms expand the space for self-determination, reconstitute democratic domains, and demonstrate the potential for alternative economic and social and political arrangements. They build, aim to build power, remake our imagination, and shift our discourse to inspire people to fight for meaningful change. 
So today's left movements are intersectional in their conceptions of the crises that face us. There are no discrete issues. Our movements are telling radical stories, denaturalizing the status quo and reconceiving of the crisis in US politics at a grand scale. These interlinked narratives create the ground for multiracial mass movements. Importantly, these are documents are designed for organizing and come out of organizing and protest. The Green New Deal as a res resolution rather than a bill seemed to me a classic organizing strategy to polarize, to draw the land in the line in the sand, forcing people literally and only just to pick a side. The Sunrise Movement, sorry, the vision for black lives included under its six large templates and suggestions for, um, under its six large templates, suggestions for federal, state, and local action based on ongoing campaigns. Invest, divest, for example, the call to divest from prisons and police and invest in housing, education, and health has been taken up around the country by local organizing campaigns. The platforms create a sense of hope and possibility for people to organize around and concrete demands uh, to work from. These policy proposals are also important because they're a plain bid for power, many of them for state power. In narrating the crisis in scales deep and broad, reaching back and rooting in histories of enslavement and colonialism and radical new futures, they create a sense of urgency and possibility. The history of the left is back alive. In DSA meetings, you hear um, people talking about socialist communist history, the vision for black lives and red nation, 10 point plan are reflecting in various ways the Black Panther template. 10-point platform and the Young Lords Party 13-point program. These law reform tools are a way to gesture at the possibilities and the concreteness of another world so that we can feel it, dream it, build it. And to remind us that our freedom dreams are connect connected to the people that came before. They also give a thing for our allies and legislatures at the local, state, and federal level to run with and a way for us to hold them accountable. They give us a reason to build our power at the ballot box as we continue to build, to build power elsewhere. So as exciting as it is that the left has moved beyond critique to building, law reform is a tool laced with risks and so we should tread cautiously. Law reform, and here I'm probably not gonna say very much that's new to anyone in this room, but it's important still to ground in it. Law reform and policy is easily a continuation of liberal politics and legalism as usual. It can be expert driven, elite centered, foundation guided, an easy extension of the ordinary work of nonprofits. And whereas grass tops nonprofits are an improvement over those that claim no connection to the grassroots, we cannot delude ourselves about the problems of nonprofits or grass tops work. That is done without engaging ordinary people, focusing on building the size, scale, and depths of our movements. The movements we are trying to build cannot be staffed and led by nonprofits. We cannot all be paid to move, work for them. As we all know, organizing is not deep or thick in many parts of the country. Law reform proposals can be a distraction from the primary work we must do. Law reform proposals can't displace organizing or protest and direct action. We have to be focused on building a healthy movement ecosystem that includes all of these various tactics and understands law reform as a tactic or a strategy in the context of a larger set of goals. Law reform, of course, has been a tool of co-optation, legitimation, and compromise running alongside state surveillance, repression, and counterinsurgency, and burnout. The centrality of state repression alone, I think, should convince more on the left of the centrality of the abolitionist struggle to all left projects. The only way to rise to the challenge is to stay focused on our goal to build movements of ordinary people, black and brown, poor and working class, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated, LGBTQ and non-binary, that are serious about decolonization and rebuilding the commons, taking land and water, housing and healthcare and education out of the market, restoring and redistributing social wealth, as the Red Deal puts it, to those who created it, workers, the poor, indigenous people, the global south, women, migrants, caretakers of the land, and the land itself. Thank you. Okay, can folks hear me? Yeah, okay, good. Um, you're gonna time me and stop me. All right. Uh, so I wanna thank Ted, Adam, and uh, the other folks who planned, sponsored, hosted this event. I'm very excited to be here. I'm gonna spend the next, I think, 15 minutes or less, um, focused on, 
Really? Wow. Okay, focused on the prospects, I'm going to read really fast, of multiracial populism among young adults, in particular millennials and Gen Zers, taking serious Ted's uh, instruction to think about where we are and how we win, and inserting what Barbara called the real world through data. Uh, she didn't say the data part, but I, I'm adding the data. Uh, and showing you pictures, but not yet. Uh, I always try to remind folks about the centrality of young adults, right? Uh, if we think about millennials, they are now the largest generation, larger than baby boomers. They comprise the largest share of the workforce and eligible voters. Maybe most importantly, they're also the most racially and ethnically diverse generation we've experienced outside of Gen Zers. But of course, it's not the demographics of this group that makes them important, not just the demographics, right? The young people at the center of this research and this data, in particular young adults of color, have grown up, as we've heard already, uh, as neoliberalism was spreading its roots in communities where controlled disinvestment and too many communities, in particular African American communities, was contained by policing and mass incarceration. They have grown up without the expectation of even a small and limited welfare state where they would be uh, supported during difficult times. Additionally, they've experience the narration and reality of globalization, where national political institutions have less control over their economic futures, and the living wage jobs of some of their parents have seemed to disappear. These young people are dealing with increasing financialization and automation of our economy, and many uh, came of age at a time when the job market was disrupted, I guess we can say, by the Great Recession of 2008. They've been relegated uh, often against their wishes to what has been labeled the gig economy, where they piece together jobs uh, to make a living, largely without benefits. They are a generation with more debt, in particular student debt, than any other generation, with 63% of millennials having at least $10,000 in debt. Uh, this is a generation that is less likely to own a home than previous generations. More broadly, millennials may be the first generation in contemporary economic history to do worse financially than their parents. So this is the generation that has lived the restructuring of racial capitalism, and attention to them, I think, tells us not only about how people are surviving this restructuring, but more importantly for this discussion, it probably tells us something about what they are ready for, new formations and systems of government and e economic exchange. Attention to young adults can tell us something about the feasibility of multicultural populism. Multi, yeah, multiracial, multiculturalism, whatever, multi, multi something. Um, but it is not only their economic experiences, right, that make young adults such an important case when thinking about multiracial populism. It's also the racial evolution in this country that they've witnessed and represent. White millennials, because of capitalization and globalization of hip hop and social media, as well as the election of Barack Obama, seem comfortable or even tolerant with racial discourse, but not, as the data will show, with the redistribution of racial power. In fact, significant numbers of young whites have moved toward a framework of white vulnerability. Now, of course, at the same time that some young whites are embracing a vulnerability framework, African Americans in general and African American young people in particular have been constantly reminded of their actual corporal and political vulnerability as what seemed like an endless stream of black people were killed by the police while in police custody or by police performing vigilantes. This attack on black people would generate yet another phase in the black radical tradition with black people taking to the streets as, as well as other comrades to defend and define their humanity and vulnerability relative to the carceral state. Now I should note that many others were similarly mobilized by the crushing political and economic environment from comrades who identify as women, cis and trans, to folks who are non-binary and gender non-conforming, to those without papers, to those who are disabled, to those who are on papers, we have seen mobilization. And despite what is undoubtedly a troubling political and economic environment, we actually may find ourselves in a moment of possibility, where deep alienation and marginalization among something we might call the people may provide, provide good ground for the growth of something you might call multiracial populism. What I want to try to do with the rest of my seven minutes, I think, is highlight the possibility and barriers to multiracial populism through data, 
However, I think like Barbara, uh, or she's much more deep on this, I'm not sure how far a multiracial framework of populism will take us. What I mean is that populism is a tool, perspective, collective organizing strategy that has been used by both the left and the right, often with, black ra often with the black radical tradition being written out of popular histories of the term. Fundamentally, it is not an ideology that inherently is meant to build a movement to combat racial capitalism, anti-black racism, the demonization of immigrants, or to reimagine approaches to climate change, the system of justice, um, or a system of justice not rooted in punishment. So I'm assuming that when we use multiracial cap popu oh God. Multi populism uh, as functioning, it, it functions as a kind of embedded radical left politics. That's what's happening in my head, right? If that's the case, then I want to make three points with my time that's remaining. First, many if not most of the young people we survey through a nationally representative sample are deeply alienated with the current political and economic structure and are open to new, and, to new economic and political formations and systems. Second, these same young adults seem ready to embrace an expansive state apparatus focused on protecting workers, taxing the wealthy, guaranteeing work for those who want it, and producing collective approaches to some of the most pressing issues of our time. So the possibility of a multiracial populism. But the possibility is once again clouded by the racism of white people, this time young whites. Here our data suggests that varying but significant numbers of young whites believe themselves to be vulnerable and under attack suggesting they are vulnerable to demagogues who would tell them to blame others instead of systems for their precarity. This we call white vulnerability racism. So maybe multiracial populism does not include most or many whites, right? So let me quickly run you through some of the data we have. I should note that the data comes from the Gen Forward survey, which Ted mentions. It's a nationally representative survey of over, uh, over 3,000 young adults ages 18 to 36. Uh, the large numbers of respondents allow us to disaggregate the data by some race and ethnic groups. Um, and I want to be clear, it's just data. Data is flawed, but data should give us some insights to kind of help us think about our strategies and at least start a discussion. And so I'm just going to run us through very fast a bunch of slides, all right? Don't complain how fast I go. All right. So I'm just going to give you a few slides on the economic and political um, uh, alienation. People who've seen data before, I mean, this, you've seen this data before, right? But most young people across race and ethnicity don't like the media. They don't like Congress. They don't like political parties. They kind of establish, I, I can share the slides, uh, the established kind of political infrastructure and institutions are thought to be um, systems or institutions that can't be trusted. If you ask questions about, and these are questions that we ask of the general population, we see it all the time, but we also see it among young people. Um, do leaders care about people like me? Again, across race and ethnicity, we see an alienation that says, no, they don't. If you ask about third party support, most young people support the idea of a third party. Um, one of the issues, of course, is that while everybody wants a third party, nobody agrees on what the third party should be. Um, so we have this kind of discontent, but no way to organize that discontent. One of the kind of interesting things, if you ask a question about sh should we rely or can we rely on the free market to handle most of the issues that confront us as a country, or do we need a strong government? In fact, young people say, yes, we need a strong government. Here's even my m more favorite, or more favorite, which is if, if you ask questions about the favorability, so one of the... Uh, issues that people have pushed back on is saying, in fact, that we can't engage with questions of capitalism or being anti-capitalist. Um, if you, when we ask about favorability of different systems, capitalism and socialism among African Americans, they're, they're much more favorable towards social, not much more, they're more favorable significantly, statistically, towards socialism than they are than capitalism. All right, so the point here is being, there's ground for alienation, and so what might they want? Right? If you ask about universal job uh, guarantee, should the government guarantee a job to every adult who wants to work? If you add these two bars, which are the strong support and somewhat support, you generally see that across race and ethnicity, at least, there's support for this idea. I'm just going to run through these. 
There's general support for the idea that, in fact, the government should have an obligation to take care of people whose jobs are displaced by robots, right? There's agreement that, in fact, a company should be required to pay a tax for every worker it displaces, right? Uh, there's agreement on the, the wealth tax, right? That we should support or oppose a 2% a tax on the assets of those with a net uh, worth of over 50 million, right? There's support for the Green New Deal. We ask this in two different ways. We ask about just support for the Green New Deal, and then even if it means raising taxes, which we often throw on to questions, uh, to try to kind of give some reality. And even when you ask, even if it means raising taxes, right, you see majorities support the idea. Here's a question. Do you support free tuition? Yes. <laughs> Do you support loan forgiveness? Yes. Uh, we did this forced choice, which is, which do you think would be better, would do more to improve public education? Increasing the pay of teachers or creating more charter schools? Overwhelmingly, what is it? Increase the pay of teachers. Uh, again, what would you do more to improve public education? Increasing funding to public schools or provi providing vouchers to individual students? It's increasing fundings to public education, to public schools. Now, I, I'm just going to really a quick caveat, which is that folks of color support vouchers if that's what is the only option. But when given a long list of other possibilities, they, they invest in schools before they go to vouchers. Uh, what would do more to improve public education? Strengthening teachers unions or weaken, weakening or ending teachers unions? It's strengthening teachers unions, right? They support eliminating cash bond. They support eliminating jail or prisons for nonviolent offenses. And they are generally positive in terms of support for immigration policy. The point is we have alienation and we have the idea that at least many young people are invested in an expansive state. So it would suggest, in fact, this is how we win, right? We, we offer an idea that, in fact, we're going to pursue policies that provide for everyone, that reimagine criminal justice, that think about climate change. But there is a problem, and it's the race and racism of young whites, or some. So if you ask a basic question about views on racism, you see generally that people will say, yeah, racism remains a problem in our society, and there's general agreement across race and ethnicity. When we ask different sorts of questions, though, like the Confederate flag question, is it a symbol of racism or Southern pride? Young people of color say it's a symbol of racism. Young whites say it's a symbol of Southern pride. When we ask a question like, do you think the killing of black people by the police is an extremely or very serious problem? This is the one I have. Less than a majority of young whites believe that the killing of black people by the police is an extremely or very serious problem. So it is this question of race and racism that becomes the issue in terms of building coalitions and in terms of building something, I guess, that we're calling multiracial capitalism. But I'll keep going. Yep. Populism. OK. What did I say? Multiracial capitalism? We have that. We have that already. We don't have to build that. That's right. Uh, so I want to talk very quickly about this thing we're calling white vulnerability racism, which is this idea among young whites that in fact they're under attack. And when we build um, a scale that tries to measure that, we, we can see the impact of this idea of vulnerability. So there are three questions that we use. One is we call changing demographics here. Do you think that the increase in the minority population strengthens, weakens, or doesn't make much of a difference? And actually the plurality of young whites says it doesn't make much of a difference. The plurality of other groups says it strengthens the country. You asked the question about, uh, are whites economically losing ground today compared to other racial and ethnic groups, right? About a third of young whites say yes to that. But the real driver of vulnerability is this question, which is, do you think that discrimination against whites, right, has become as big of a problem as discrimination against blacks and other minorities? And just about half of young whites say yes to that question. So when you combine those, we combine them into something we call white vulnerability racism uh, measure. What do we know? We know that it, 
those who score high on that measure are much, much, much more likely to vote for someone like Trump. If you are, have no college and you've scored high on this measure and they're very highly correlated, you're basically definitely going to vote for Trump. Um, high but white vulnerability, even when you can hear, oh, I have to put this on. I know my time is running. I promise you, I promise, it's almost over, it's almost over. Um, if, you, if you're doing an analysis and you're controlling, meaning you're taking into account these other things like party, ideology, age, gender, income, the thing that matters most in terms of determining your approval for Trump and Trump vote is this perspective of being vulnerable, white vulnerability. It also has the same type of impact on immigration policies and anti-immigrant views. So again, if we're talking about where we are and what we can build, the question is how do we reimagine and re-engage, and I hate to say it, young whites and having a different narrative about what their position is, their positionality, and who in fact can speak to that positionality and what can be the, the response. I'm looking straight at you, Ted, but okay. Uh, well, <laughs> you'll answer right now. The last, I'll show this last slide, which is when we ask a question like, what's the best way to make racial progress? This is, I think, it's always organizing, 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 and then organizing down here. Young African Americans, I do love that revolution. <laughs> Revolution is always the answer. Um, but I think the other thing to take from this is how much they hate electoral politics. And so the idea that we're engaging, in particular, young adults, to move them somewhere through an electoral position may be the wrong starting place. Right. All right. I think that's it. OK. Thanks. Oops. There we go. Um, thanks to all of you. Is this is this working? Can folks hear me? Um, okay. Uh, I don't want to take very much time of my own, and I'm going to turn it over to questions in one second. I just want to sort of observe that um, you know sometimes you organize a panel, and it's sort of not clear to you when you sit down how the things are going to thread together, and then it's just completely on the nose. So um, I think we're, 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 these three things come together in a very powerful way, and, and get to the heart of I think what we really all need to grapple with. Um, you know, Daniel has pointed out um, very real, I would say, binding constraints of the American political system um, that we either have an answer to or we're all collectively screwed. There's just no, there's no way around it. Um, I think Amna has pointed to um, the expansive possibilities and, ima and the imaginary of radical transformation that is just all around us at this moment and, in a way, um, what we're seeing through what we see through Kathy's presentation is um, that it's got a, a quite a lot of purchase, right? Um, it, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not niche, right? Um, what what uh, social movements have started to put forward, mm -hmm. and yet, right? Um, it's also not necessarily, and the white vulnerability question, even amongst a demographic. I mean, if we looked at that same question among older folks. Yeah it would get, the picture would get much bleaker, bleaker. much more quickly, right? And so mm -hmm. when you think about where those folks are concentrated and the mm -hmm. disproportionate political power that our political system gives them, right, right what then become, what, what then become the strategies? And one of the, as we were preparing for this panel, one of the things I was thinking about is sort of, you know, you listed the um, uh, sort of uh, programs for an expansive state that win wide majorities. What are the things that we can all probably bet that not just the sort of white vulnerability demographic um, would be opposed to, but also the you know educated liberals who are moving left manifestly in the in the Trump moment? What are the things that they're not going to get on board with? For me, it's always desegregation. Is always the you know if you really want to talk about racial capitalism, we're talking about housing, we're talking about schools, we're talking about how assets get accumulated in the society and passed down between generations, right? Are we, is that gonna be able to be on the agenda or if we do, do we start to splinter the potential coalition that can get on board with a jobs guarantee or, right? And I, I don't know, right? I mean, there's, there's data coming from a lot of different directions, some of which is hopeful, some of which is discouraging. And, and, and that's, um, you know, that's what I think we gotta deal with. But 
Working Families Party is probably going to try to get really involved in, in Arizona elections this year. How does the situation look in Arizona? You know, Carlos Garcia is going to join us this afternoon and, and hopefully going to give us some insight. But a lot of people in Arizona, you know, probably score pretty pretty bad on a lot of those questions. And, and so, anyway, so just threading these things together, I think this is a, a, a perfect um, uh, overview of the of the real dilemmas that that that, that we on the left face in this moment. Um, so with that, I want to uh, open it up to questions. Um, try to take 15 minutes, and then, and, and, or you know, 18 maybe, depending on how many questions folks uh, want to ask, and then, uh, and and then we'll break for lunch. And just want to thank the panelists again for for really thoughtful comments. different things, I, w I guess I would say. One is, I think if you look at folks who have been organizing around the movement for black lives or, you know, in more specific organizations, whether it's BYP 100 or Dream Defenders or, right. um, you know, if we go back to 2016, they had a, a disruption, I think, strategy with regards to elections, but not an engagement with regards right. to elections, right? And I think what we have seen uh, what we see from our data is that there's a belief among young people that elections don't do anything, right? That the same types of individuals across party largely uh, get elected, that those individuals are detached from kind of the struggles that we're talking about. That, And I think for a lot of young people, um, it was articulated around the election of Barack Obama, right? We did these focus groups with young black people who said, it's great that he's president, fantastic, has changed nothing in my life, right? Like I'm still getting stopped and frisked. My school, you know, during Obama's term, I think it was during his term, right? 50 schools get closed on the south and west sides in Chicago. So I, I think, and I would also argue that a lot of these young people have grown up with, uh, in communities where there've been the election of, of mayors of color, and they've recognized that their kind of lived condition doesn't change through elections, and that largely the place where they want to invest is through organizing, through organizing, through organizing. Yeah. Um, it, oh, oh, oh. So, yeah, should I go first? Um, so the wonderful presentations and uh, just, you know, the, the statistics were incredibly eye-opening. And I guess I, just, I had a question about where you see the flexibility in the white vulnerability arguments. Um, and in a way, I guess what I was thinking about is one of the things that I've really been struck by in American politics, you know, I guess over the last 10 years, but really this is a story um, from the 80s to the present, is the right appropriation of anti-discrimination um, rhetoric. And in a way, we can just think of this as when you have moments of transformation, like with the civil rights movement, there's inevitably going to be a reaction. And one of the most distinctive forms of reaction is the way in which discrimination talk is in fact just the ubiquitous way in which demands get made. And indeed, the most powerful arguments that are getting made right now to defend hierarchy, subordination, are precisely through equality talk. So Scalia, um, before he dies in Shelby County, so the case about the Voting Rights Act, calls the Voting Rights Act a racial entitlement, saying that the act itself is discriminatory effectively against white people. You know, the language of a Christian majority um, co white coalition, you know, that's attempting to essentially impose various forms of discrimination against LGBT people, people of color. It's all through the language of religious liberty. And of course, all of this is happening in a neoliberal age, essentially, where other ways of making demands, in particular class demands organized through institutions like unions, have essentially disappeared. And so I, I just, I'm curious about how the ubiquity of anti-discrimination talk maps onto how people are able to articulate their own vulnerability and what that might mean for the like the you know the statistics that we see and whether or not that's those statistics are in fact perhaps more movable 
in a context with different kinds of language. On point, and and I guess first of all, I always worry that we call it white vulnerability racism, and in discussions, people only talk about it as white vulnerability, right? And mm -hmm. part of what we want to make sure we don't lose is the way in which that gets leveraged into kind of clearly racist positions when it comes to, you know, uh, people of color, when it comes to issues of discrimination uh, or immigration. But I, I think you're right. I think, you know, there has been a growing language. I, I don't know if I'd say growing. There's been a constant language of, of loss, of status, of um, the taking of the position of jobs, right? And that there is a kind of narration of whites as living in this kind of vulnerable state. And that has been dominated in particular by the right. But um, even if we think back to what happened after 2016, the, even from, I wouldn't say the left, but from Democrats, there was this concern about how do we deal with and how do we solidify right the white working class. And there was a kind of uh, agreement that they, they were in a position of loss. And so we have to figure out how to speak to their loss, right? I, I think these young people that we've seen in our survey, you know, I think there's the possibility of movement. Um, there has to be a different type of articulation of understanding, and I, because I think there is loss, but the loss isn't from folks of color, right? The loss is from corporations, the loss is from globalization, the loss is from financialization. And the question is, how do we have that extended conversation with people? And I think that goes back to organizing, right? That you build an infrastructure where you are in touch with and talking to people on a constant basis. When Mo uh, began his talk, he said the Working Families Party is committed to this idea of on, ongoing political education. And I think that comes from right, being in community with people, being in close proximity, and having a sustained conversation. I worry that, in fact, what we do is that at the time of an election, we try to explain to people their real positionality versus being in conversation, listening to, and then responding to people and moving them that way through through organizing. So, um, I, yeah, I had a comment and a question. Um, so I'm coming, and 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 this is for Kathy, Jarimar Bonilla, and I'm coming from Puerto Rico and um, thinking, you know. Although this won't be the focus of, of my presentation later, but I've been thinking obsessively about the summer movement there this past summer and what I heard from young people there. And uh, I just want to say that the data that you laid out, it really resonated with what I'm hearing from people in Puerto Rico in terms of how they think about the government, how they think about elections. And so um, I think. So first, the comment that I think there needs to be more dialogue between, you know, kind of U.S.-based and and Puerto Rico-based scholars on these issues, because for me, it's it's really eye-opening to make the connections um, between what I'm thinking of as a particular political affect coming out of Puerto Rico's failed colonial experiment, and then seeing, you know, the this data. Um, so a question that I had was um, the what young people were saying about uh, election not being terribly invested in elections because it doesn't really matter who's in power that that was cute that Obama was in power but it didn't really you know change how you know our experience that's the same thing that that folks in Puerto Rico are saying uh, and about these same characters um, there, there I, I interviewed someone who said that I asked them what they thought of Obama and he said es incoloro colorless which I thought was really interesting I mean in in, in Spanish it just means like ah, unremarkable or something but the invocation of color was really fascinating to me and so a lot of folks have been trying to mobilize Puerto Ricans um, for the next electoral cycle and, and immediately after the summer movement people are like oh we need to get Puerto Ricans involved in getting rid of Trump um, and so and Puerto Ricans don't care about Trump because he you know he, he's just yet another in in a series of imperial presidents and even though you know for I think for a lot of Puerto Ricans we just feel that he just says the quiet parts out loud and that he 
in any in in if anything he's done us a favor uh by you know bringing a media spotlight to a you know a, an imperial relationship that that was rarely discussed um so my question is uh these these uh young people that are saying that it doesn't really matter how do they feel about getting trump out of office is that something that they are hype about or or is he yet another politician and it doesn't really matter Thanks so much. I mean, others should also jump in. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be quick. I, I think there is uh, concern, and you know, we just ask these questions about: Do you think Trump is a racist? So, yes. But we also know, and I think people who study p political science know that knows that, know that um, people being anti-Trump doesn't mean, in fact, they show up to vote against Trump, right? There has to be an infrastructure of mobilization. There has to be a way in which the other candidates actually speak to the concerns that young people are, you know, are articulating. Um, so, you know, are they, what did you say, hyped about Trump? Or hyped about getting uh, Trump out of office? I think they, uh, Yes, there's a commitment for most of the young people, in particular young folks of color, meaning in this case African American, Latinx, and Asian American young people, to vote against Trump. Um, it's there's less clarity on who their candidate will be. So I, you know, we have some um, what we call head to heads, where we ask about would you vote for Trump or Beto or Trump, and you know, uh, and it's uh, there's some splits in terms of there's no clear sense of who would win. There's some, a few Democrats that clearly beat Trump. So I, I, I think the, you know, we're, we're still a year away. I think it's unclear what the mobilization is gonna look like. It's not clear what the candidate who will get the nomination will articulate in terms of the issues that matter. And I guess I wanna say just something about, I, I think for the young people that we talk to, um, or young adults, that there is a difference between Obama and Trump, right? So I, I'm not sure they would agree that it's the same thing. Um, and you know, to Dan's point about polarization, one of the other things we see is very deep polarization. And we ask a question about, you know, do you think the other party's ideas actually poses a threat to the nation? And there's very high agreement on that question. So it's not just that I'm not a Democrat. The last thing I'll say is, but to the question of parties, and I think Dan has seen this also, is what the data shows is that what's motivating people to vote is not any love for the party that they identify with, it is hatred for the other party, right? So there are a lot of young folks who will say, I'm a Democrat. They don't like the Democrats, but they hate the Republicans, and they hate, or they think they hate Trump. So that becomes the mobilizing uh, piece of this. But others should jump in. Uh, yeah, I think that the, we live in a country defined by negative polarization, and the question for us is how do we go take, take that negative polarization to actually firing people up and turn that into something that's more than just stop them politics. Um, on age in particular, it turns out that the age gradient in voting is pretty steep, really young people don't vote, it's hard to vote in America, they're not rooted in the community. But that was my next sentence. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Exactly. The, what we saw in the 2018 midterm was really impressive increases over 2014. Of, 30 million. Right, right. And that that, that actually says that now may be different, which is really good. I also just want to throw one one observation in here that, to this question about young folks and electoral politics and young working class people, young working class people of color in particular, and I've seen this in work that I do with different organizations, that candidates like someone like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Ilhan Omar or Tiffany Caban in Queens, um, there's some combination of their youth, their um, lived experience and their ability to talk about it um, that young people in particular do not group them in with the run-of-the-mill politicians. So that thing that says, oh, it's all the same, it doesn't matter who you elect. There is a class of candidates, uh, both because of what they talk about, their life experience, and how they stitch those things together, that land in a completely different way. And, and part of, I mean, to me, one of the hopeful things is about um, the possibility of candidates like that talking about things like Amna was laying out um, in a context of very high mobilization that is in part driven by the bad guys, right? And how 
openly sort of scary that they've become. What I don't know is, and it really goes to that geographic question, like how, how far, yeah. how many different places can you assemble that kind of politics? But. And, and we want really, really good charismatic candidates, but run only extremely good charismatic candidates always is, right. can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Mo sometimes says that we need a mediocre and accountable is a, is a standard that we should be at. Sometimes a minimum standard, yeah. Uh, maybe one more question over here, yeah. Um, you've already answered the majority of my questions. They kind of fall all up the same way what we were talking about earlier. Um, so I'll just get straight to it. It's how can um, we create a dynamic between um, organizing and electoral politics? Yeah. Because with Trump, like, like um, Kathy, you said earlier that many um, young citizens don't see the purpose in voting. But with Trump, we do. We saw that for rich people, they got a lot more money. For everyone else, they either lost money or got like a tiny bit. So there is a direct correlation that can happen. So that just goes back to my main point, like how can we create a dynamic between between organizing, which most, especially peop, uh, peop, people will agree with, and uh, politics. There's a lot of work to do on that front, but I think in some sense the short answer, the open possibility is through these law reform campaigns that are being waged at different levels of governance, right? So like obviously one big difference between the two examples I was mostly using, Vision for Black Lives and Green New Deal, is they're talking mostly about uh, under the Vision for Black Lives, the push has mostly been at the local level, whereas the Green New Deal is at the national level. Um, but I think, I mean, that was part of why I was asking about this electoral piece, because, um, you know, there's a relationship between law reform to the extent you're talking about formal pieces of legislation, right? There's also, you know, all the um, uh, ballot initiatives of various sorts that kind of work through a different avenue, but also touch on these questions of electoral work and organizing. Um, but I think we have seen, at least, that that has been an attempt. But I can say, I mean, I named Ohio issue one, which was a sort of a decarceral ballot initiative that it was the only thing I named in the local stuff that failed. But I think one of the reasons why it failed is that a lot of the um, is this being recorded and live streamed? Not live streamed, but it is recorded. Okay, um, I think one of the reasons why it failed um, is because um, some of the major organizing outfits in the state were involved in um, that, uh, in pushing for issue one, but while they were working on issue one, it kind of displaced all of the other work, and so the organizing, I think, became both scaled up, but less deep, mm -hmm. and so everything became, so not only did we fail, we, we, not only were we unable to pass issue one, but our entire organizing community was depleted. We actually, I mean, we had two people die in the last six months. I mean, I think this goes also to, some of the points that you were making, Dan, and really kind of um, the, the great kind of, um, pr I mean, in Ohio, we have lost three young people, two young black people to suicide in our organizing space. Um, and so to me, that speaks to the very deep demands, not, and like reason why not only that we need to build this other world, but also why we need to grow our movements, because it's the same people who are often, um, you know, showing up for all these forms of struggle. I don't know if that really answers your question, but I do think the law reform stuff is one place to kind of think and talk about that. Um, I, I want to I want to not keep people from their lunch, but Barbara, I want if you is it possible we can sort of uh, bridge it into the next? Okay, cool. Um, all right, thank you everyone so much. Uh, thank the panelists.